Good morning, students. Sorry for the delay. There was some uh, uh, problem with the uh, power supply here. We didn't have power supply till now. So there was this delay. But in spite of my delay, I still find just 80 students, 79, 80 students in the class. That's disappointing. I thought you would be ready with your uh, systems to enter the class as soon as it started. Okay. So today's topic will be clear clip and palette. But before going to start this topic now, I would just like to take a small quiz. Uh, you know, I'll be asking you some very easy questions on the uh, topics covered in my last classes. Okay, holy cavity. This is just to brush your knowledge and also for me to know how far you're going, uh, how far you're understanding the topics that I have covered. Okay, so I would like you people to answer through chat. This 86 participants, 86 students that have entered the class. We just do the small quiz till we get the entire uh, strength, class strength. Okay, so the first question. What the most strongly implicated pre-management condition of the oral cavity is? Is it medial rhomboid glossitis? Is it erythroplakia? Is it erythema multiforme? Or leukoplakia? So I've already got answers from row numbers 102, 108, uh, 124. Okay. Uh, but I'm sorry to say this is not the right answer. Shall I wait for the right answer? Wait. There is no E option. There are only four options. Number 67, there are only four options. Oh, you mean to say, okay, you mean to say the fourth option, you could play here. Yeah. There are six, seven. I'll just wait for some more answers. I did not get the list of your roll numbers. Because of this disturbance, I forgot to get my papers. I do not know your roll numbers names. 061. 061, can you please type your name also? Number 061. Register number ending with 61. Okay. Thank you, Vaishnavi. I'm happy that uh, so many of you have answered. Very nice. But the right answer is not leukoplakia. Uh, only Vaishnavi has answered it correctly. When I said it's strongly implicated, I meant to say the maximum probability of turning into malignant. So it is erythroplakia. Yes, number 132 also has answered it, erythroplakia. Erythroplakia has the highest probability of transformation to a malignancy. Out of all the options, erythroplakia, erythroleukoplakia is one of the types of leukoplakia which is again having the highest probability of turning into malignancy. Leukoplakia is the commonest pre-malignant lesion that occurs. More than leukoplakia, the erythroplakia has the highest probability of progression to malignancy. Number 132 has also answered. I would like to know their names. Okay, so this is the first question. This is the second question. What is the commonest site of oral cancers among the Indian population? So what is the most common oral cancer among the Indian sub in the Indian subcontinent? This is the question. Okay, I've just got one answer so far. Let's do this a little bit faster so that you know we're already late. Okay, two answers 073 and uh, 30. 
has answered right. Okay. One, two, four. I would like one, three, two to please uh, give me their name also. One, three, two, one, four, one. Please type in their names just for me to have an idea. Okay, Divya. Vaishnavi, Divya, yes. The girls, Jahnavi, one, four, one. Okay, so Divya has answered it rightly. First, after that, even one two, one has answered, I think. The answer is the Agnew Buckley complex. Okay. See, Agnew Buckley complex has the highest incidence in the Indian subpopulation. Uh, some of you have answered tongue. Tongue is in the Western countries. Tongue, highest incidence in the Western countries. Tongue also, have, also has the highest incidence of nodal spread. That is, the regional lymph nodes, the cervical lymph nodes, nodal spread is highest for tongue. Okay? And lip has the best prognosis of all the cancers in the oral cavity. Okay, so this is with the second question answers. Now identify the or give me the spot diagnosis of this picture. Spot diagnosis of this picture. Zero, 0.30. Zero. I haven't started with cleft palate and lip. So this will definitely not be the answer. I'm asking you questions from my previous classes, not from the class I'm going to tell you now. So this is not the answer. It looks like that, but did I ever tell you this is cleft lip and palate? Do you think that is cleft? Cleft? Scarring on cheek. So this topic, I don't think any of you have listened keenly. At least you should have gone back to your books after the class and then gone through the uh, subject matter. Why is there scarring on the cheek? Uh, number 108. Did you give the right answer? You give the probable differential diagnosis for this picture. So I cannot expect answers other than that. So this topic you have to go through again and give out the answer. Let's not waste time. This is cancrum oris or also called Noma. Right? So this is quite uh, commonly seen in the malnourished uh, children. Mostly in the sub Saharan uh, regions. It's nothing but an infective ganglion, extensive infective ganglion that starts in the lips, extends to the gums, and spreads to the cheek, also affecting the bone, the maxilla, or the mandible, if it is lower jaw, in the soft tissues, and ultimately onto the skin, causing extensive tissue loss. There is extensive tissue loss, giving you an appearance of a cleft, but this is not cleft at all. This is not at all the location we are. We are place for cleft okay so this is not cleft if at all you give me an answer that maybe i should have considered the carcinoma which is not which is a differential diagnosis for cancer oris but okay this is cancer oris also called noma okay there's extensive necrosis of the mucous membrane in the oral cavity 
and also destruction of the soft tissues within an exterior. Okay, now what is the type of flap used here for reconstruction of the center part of the lip? There's a, there's a, there is a malignant lesion, ulcerative lesion on the central part of the lower lip, and then there was a planned reconstruction after excession of the lesion with complete clearance, macroscopic clearance, then the planning for reconstruction. What is the reconstruction that is being shown here in this picture? Number seven three has answered. One zero eight also has answered. Okay, again one forty one. One forty one. Can you please give me your name? I'm sorry if I'm asking for the invitation. Yeah, Jab Nabi. Okay. Also answer the second question, no? Okay. First, I think 108 was answered. Give me an answer, no. It is 073. 73, I would like you to give me the explanation for your answer. Okay? 73, please type in your explanation. Why do you opt it for that answer? Seventy-three. We don't have any explanation. This. Okay, I'm not waste time. I know. When I said you the center of the lip, most of you would have gone for Eddie's flap. But see, there is this step ladder pattern, right? So the step ladder pattern. It's this kind of reconstruction of the central defect in the lower lip is done in a Johnson step ladder flap. Okay. Here it is the complete thickness, symmetrical uh, excision here, so and then over, over step ladder in a stepwise manner so as to cover the defect. After reconstruction, okay. at this flap, yes, it is done for lesions in the central part of the lip, central pit lip, but a smaller in size. As lander flap for the angle of the mouth. When the lesion is towards the angle of the mouth, you need reconstruction towards the angle, then you use an as lander flap. Bernard flap, again, lower lip reconstruction, but it is a huge lesion. It's almost it is not here, done here, it is a cheek advancement flap. Bernard flap is a cheek advancement flap. Cheek advancement where you have this, I told you, a burrows uh, triangle. After the defect, those are closed. So this is example for an advancement flap. Cheek is used here. Johnson step ladder flap is the answer for this picture. So identify this lesion on the gum. The next question. One zero two. This is on the gum. It is not on the floor of the mouth as you think. You've given an answer for the floor of the mouth, but this is on the gum. I told you. Any other answers? We should not waste time in these questions, right? This is just for revision. Submucosal fibrosis. Don't you find the spelling here? You just think it is alveolar abscess. Oh my god. I don't think any of you have listened to my class. I've shown all these pictures in my class now. 
Ito guys yung gum. Ano dyan may gano'y lumang? No. So it's not happy patient, it's not biogenic granuloma, so. It's a uplus. Yes, 031 has answered. This is swelling arising from the mucoperiosteum of the gum. Last class, the last 15 minutes, I talked about the various swellings on the, in the only cavity. This is one of it is UPS. So identify this picture. Identify the picture and the diagnosis from this picture. This is the lesion that's marked in red. This is an investigative picture showing the lesion and hence the diagnosis. Why is there no answer? So, I think I should uh, go to the inference that we don't listen to the last part of the class, to the end of the class. No, no, yeah. no. Any other answer? Anyone else willing to answer? Let's do it fast. Nobody wants to even give a try? No, I should just pick up one number and then have, they have to answer. Okay. Should I do that? 037, can you please type in your name? Only Gautam is listening to my class. Nobody else is listening. Even Gautam has taken so much of time before. Oh, very good. So give me out the answers. Are you opening the book and telling me the answer? Okay, okay. The image was not clear before. Okay. I take your answer. So, so this is a dentigidus cyst, as Gautam is rightly answered. It's a unilocular cyst arising in relation to the dental epithelium from an unerected tooth. So, on the OPG or two quantum program, you get to see the unerected tooth within the cyst cavity. The cyst cavity is so well defined. You can also identify the unerected tooth below the normal erected teeth. Okay. So this is with the last class questions. So I would like you all to go to the topics, go to the topics in your textbooks and come back with some questions if you really have an interest in. Okay. So for today's class, I'll start with cleft disorders. What is cleft exactly? It is a crack or a fissure or a split or a gap. So the clefts of the lip, alveolus, hard and soft palate, these are the most common congenital abnormalities of the orofacial structures. The structures in the mouth and face, these are the structures that have a cleft, that show a cleft. 
and these are all congenital abnormalities. They frequently occur as isolated deformities or in combination with deformities along with other medical conditions, most commonly congenital heart diseases. Okay, so the syndromic uh, association usually mostly with congenital heart diseases. So all children born with a cleft lip on the palate, they need a pediatric assessment so as to exclude the other congenital abnormalities and hence the diagnosis of a syndrome. And then a genetic counseling must also be sought if the syndrome is suspected. So what is the incidence of cleft disorders? Cleft lip and palate together it is around 1 in 600 live births. Only cleft palate, isolated cleft palate, whether it be the hard or soft palate, it is almost about 1 in 1000 live births. So the incidence of cleft is, is maximum amongst all the orofacial abnormalities, congenital abnormalities. Okay, the incidence increases in the oriental groups to as much as one in five hundred, and decreases in the black, black population. So, before you know what, how a cleft is formed, you have to know the embryology. That is the normal development of the face. So, face develops from the from five processes, out of which. One is an unpaired process or a prominence, and there are four paired processes. The unpaired one is the frontal process. The paired ones are four in number. They are the frontal, uh, sorry, uh, the maxillary process, the mandibular process, median nasal process, and the lateral nasal process. Okay, so it develops from the median nasal process, the lateral nasal process, the maxillary process, and the mandibular arch. Any change in development or fusion of these arches leads to formation of different types of cleft lip and palate. So down third to fourth week of intrauterine life, you have the development of the brachial, brachial arches. The first arch is the mandibular arch, development of the nasomaxillary complex. So around third or fourth week, you get to form these processes. The first mandibular arch will give you the nasomaxillary complex. Then the mandibular arch gives rise to the maxillary process. From about fifth to sixth week, there's the formation of the nasal pits and grooves in the frontomaxillary process, dividing it into a medial nasal process and the lateral. There are two lateral nasal processes single medial basal process and two later basal processes. Okay. So these maxillary processes fuse with the medial and lateral process. This maxillary process fuses with the medial and lateral process to form the upper lip and the primary palate respectively. Okay. Now development of the palate in particular it begins in the sixth week. It develops from the primary palate that is the medial nasal process from the secondary palate develops from the maxillary process. The maxillary process forms the secondary palate that is behind the incisive foramen and the one that is in front of the incisive foramen is the primary palate. It is formed from the medial nasal process. Okay, so this includes the alveolus and the uh, fecum of the lip, the primary palate. This is the secondary palate, the hard palate part, a hard palate and soft palate, secondary palate, formed by the fusion of the maxillary process, palate and plates of the maxillary process. Okay. So the palate is formed by the contribution of the maxillary process, the frontonasal process, and the palatal shell from the maxillary processes. Now the frontonasal process gives rise to the pre-maxillary palate, which I told you in front of the Inside the foramen, this is the pre maxillary process, or the primary palate is formed from the frontonasal processes. While the palatal shells give rise to the rest of the palate, which is nothing but the secondary palate behind the incisive foramen. Okay? The fusion of the two palatal shells it begins at the eighth week and continues till the 12th to 17th embryonic week. Initially, the palatal shells are covered by an epithelial lining. Slowly, as these palatal shells are fusing, the epithelial cells regenerate and then there is connective tissue formation. 
then intermingle which intermingle with each other resulting in their in the fusion of these two palatal plates halves palatal shelves on either sides so when there is defective fusion of these plates then yes you get a cleft palate development of the lip lip is derived as from the medial lesser process the upper lip and the lower lip from the maxillary process so the lower lip is formed by the fusion of the sorry the upper lip is formed from the medial lesser process and the maxillary process fusion and the lower lip is formed by fusion of the mandibular process on both the sides failure of merging between the medial lesser process and the maxillary process in the fifth week of gestation on one side or on both the sides Will give rise to a cleft lip. The cleft lip is usually more common on the upper lip because of defective fusion or incomplete fusion between the medial nasal and the maxillary processes. It's the same part that I've shown you. The mandibular process gives rise to the lower lip. The upper lip formed from the frontal nasal process and the maxillary process, the lateral part. So, cleft of the palate occurs in a number of ways, either because of development of defective growth of the palatal shelves that form the secondary palate, or delayed or total failure of shelves to elevate and attain a horizontal position, and lack of contact between the shelves, post fusion rupture of shelves, also failure of mesenchymal consolidation. So, these are just the points of pathogenesis of the cleft palate. Actually, try to uh, show you a small clipping wherein the development of face is shown to you. There is some problem with this; it is not uh, opening. Since I don't have a board here, I thought I could just try to show you the stepwise formation of the face to the fusion of these uh, processes. Sorry, I. Some problem with this, it is not starting. Okay, so excuse me for that. Uh, coming to the anatomy of the cleft lip and palate. So, what happens during this defective fusion? For the cleft lip, first, the abnormalities in the cleft lip, the direct consequence of disruption of the muscles of the upper lip. In the nasolabial region, the nasolabial region, the nasolabial region, this region. So the facial muscles are divided into three muscular rings of the leg. The one is the nasolabial muscle that surrounds the nasal aperture, the nasolabial labial muscles. The bilabial muscle ring surrounds the oral apertures, and labiomental muscle that uh, ring that enlarges the lower lip and the chin regions. So these are the three. Uh, rings of muscles as divided by the layer that help to explain the defective fusion in a cleft disorder. Okay, cleft lip disorder, the nasolabial muscle, the bilabial muscle ring, and the labiomental muscle ring. Okay, same is shown in the picture here. This is the nasal cartilage. This A. Number one is the transverse nasalis. Number two, this is the levator labia superioris and the inferior side. And number three, the levator labia superioris. So these three muscles form the nasolabial complex of muscle group. <coughs> Next, group B formed by orbitalis oris, the upper lip. Orbitalis is also again with the horizontal head. This is the vertical head on the oblique head. This is the horizontal head. And orbitalis or is the lower lip. All this forms the bilabial group of muscles. Next, labiomental group of muscles is the depressor angularis. Number seven, this one is depressor angularis. Depressor labia inferioris and the mentalis muscle. These three group of muscles form the 
labial mental mucus muscles. So defect infusion in these muscles will result in a cleft lip. In unilateral left, the cleft lip, the nasolabial bi and bilabial muscles rings are disrupted on one side, on single side. Hence, that is a symmetrical, asymmetrical deformity that involves the external nasal cartilage, the nasal septum, and the anterior maxilla or the premaxilla. So these deformities influence the mucocutaneous tissues, causing the displacement of the nasal skin onto the lip and the diffraction of the labial skin and changes to the vermilion and lip mucosa. See, unilateral cleft lip, there's disruption of the nasolabial and the bilabial muscle group on one side. Hence, the nasal septum and the hand also is involved. This is the clinical picture. In case of a bilateral cleft lip on both sides, the deformity is symmetrical since it is involving both sides. So the two superior muscular rings are disrupted on both sides, producing a flaring of the nose. Because of the nasal labial muscle, which is discontinuous, there is flaring of the nose. And also a protrusive preaxilla. The preaxilla is protruding out upwards. An area of skin in front of the premaxilla devoid of muscle. So this has no muscle, just a flap of skin in front of the maxilla. This is called the prolabium. Prolabium, it's supposed to form the labium. As in the unilateral clip, the muscular cartilaginous and skeletal deformities influence the mucocutaneous tissues again. So, which must be corrected during a repair, both in case of unilateral and a bilateral cleft lip. See, destruction of the nasolabial, the bilateral muscle chains, and bilateral disease, leading to formation of a symmetrical deformity and a prolabium. The pro promaxilla is protruding out, and there is a prolabium. This is can fold without the muscle tissue. In case of a cleft palate, the anatomical disturbances. How is the primary palate formed? I told you. Anterior to the incisor foramen. It contains the alveolus and the upper lip. In secondary palate, remainder of the palate formed from the palatal shells behind the incisor foramen. It has both the hard palate and the soft palate. Hard palate uh, anteriorly and more posteriorly, so soft palate. So the cleft palate results in the failure of fusion of the two palatal shells. This failure is either confined to the soft palate or maybe extending onto the hard palate, also involving both hard and soft palate. When the cleft on the hard palate remains attached to the nasal septum and vomer, then the cleft is incomplete. That is attachment to the sept nasal septum, so it is incomplete cleft. But when the cleft is extending onto the nasal septum and the vomer, then separating the two halves of the palate, then it is called a complete cleft palate. So these are the terminologies that we get to uh, come across. So incomplete and complete. So soft palate, cleft. Normally the closure of the velopharynx, which is essential for normal speech, is achieved by five different muscles functioning in a complete and coordinated fashion. So what are the five different muscles? They are the tensor palatite, the levator palatite, and the palatopharyngeus, palatoglossus, and the musculus uvula. The uvula. Okay, so these in coordinated fashion help in articulation of speech. So the muscle fibers of the soft palate are oriented transversely normally. They are not usually attached to the hard palate, but in case of a cleft in the soft palate, these muscles are oriented anterior posteriorly. They are oriented anterior posteriorly and inserted onto the posterior edge of the hard palate. So this is how in a cleft lip, the muscles are attached to the hard palate, hence resulting in difficulty in speech if there is a soft palate cleft. Okay. Now what happens in the hard palate cleft? The normal hard palate is divided into three anatomical and physiological zones. They are the central 
palatal fibromucosa, which is very thin and lies directly below the floor of the nose. The maxillary fibromucosa, which is thick and it contains the greater palatine neurovascular bundle and the gingival, gingival fibromucosa, which lies near at the teeth, around surrounding the teeth. Okay, so adjacent to the teeth, that is the third zone or the peripheral zone, which is the gingival fibromucosal layer of the heart palate. The middle one is the maxillary fibromucosal layer. The central one is the palatal fibromucosal layer, which is mostly thin. That it, it lies directly below the nose. So, this is to explain you the formation and the difficulties in the cleft of the palate, hard palate. So, what are the etiological factors of a cleft disorder? Mostly they are familial, they come in the common the cleft lip, or combined cleft lip and palate. This increases for 1 in 25 live births. Associated etiological factors are deficiencies in protein and vitamins, infections, and maternal epilepsy and drug intake during pregnancies. So, so the etiological factors can be divided into environmental factors again, they're divided into four categories the environment in the womb, womb environment, the external environment, the nutritional environment, and the drugs, maternal drugs. Okay. Certain drugs that act as teratogens cause birth defects, like there's other drugs like antiemetics, antiepileptic drugs, phenytoin, valproic acid, halidomide, digoxin, retinoic acid, also maternal alcohol abuse, and maternal cigarette smoking are the teratogenic uh, factors that may cause cleft disorders in the womb. Some of the teratogens, like rubella infections, Cortisone ingestion, mercaptopurin, methotrexate, valium are also teratogenic in nature. Infections like rubella, syphilis, and toxoplasmosis during pregnancy can cause cleft disorders. Also, I told you methanol alcohol that causes interruption in the migration and differentiation of the neural crest cells, forming to defective fusion. The embryos exposed to methanol smoking also have increased risk of cleft disorders. The predisposing factors for clefts are increased maternal age, those who conceive women who conceive late, have increased risk of having offsprings with clefts. Racial mongoloids have highest incidence of clefts. Also, defective blood supply in utero because of certain factors that reduce the blood supply to the maxillary areas, maxillary areas during the embryological development may form defective fusion of lips and palate. I told you it is associated with certain syndromes like Down syndrome, Wardenberg syndrome, orofacial digital syndrome, tracheal column syndrome, Piri Robin syndrome. This is more common. Piri Robin syndrome is nothing but isolated cleft palate. Retrognathia and posterior displaced tongue. So, this is most commonly found uh, syndrome with association in cleft disorder, also triple heel syndrome. So, how do you investigate antenatal diagnosis? With an ultrasound or a 3D ultrasonography, it enables the utero, in utero diagnosis of clefts as early as in the, from the 18th week onwards. 18th week onwards, you can diagnose cleft lips and cleft palate. This is the picture of a 3D ultrasonogram showing cleft disorders of the embryo. So what are the advantages of this early diagnosis? That is, number one, the parent has uh, time for getting educated on the management of the baby that is going to be born. It also allows the psychological preparation of the parents and allows them to have a realistic expectations it gives opportunity to investigate the presence of other chromosomal abnormalities. Also, the parent has a choice of continuing or discontinuing the pregnancy. It also helps in getting prepared for the neonatal feeding and care after birth. And also, there are in certain areas, advanced areas, uh, there are options for fetal surgeries. 
So what are the risk factors? Hereditary risk, it is a hereditary disease, I told you. There's a risk of children of parents with cleft. There is a risk. Or a sibling who is having a cleft, the risk is as much as 4%. The risk is significantly smaller for second degree relatives. So a second degree relative with a cleft, then you have 0.6% risk factor of getting a cleft lip in the present pregnancy. So coming to classification of cleft disorders, if it is involving the cleft lip alone, only the lip is unilateral, bilateral, or the median, the central one. Unilateral on either side, right or left, bilateral on both sides, median, the central one. Cleft of primary palate alone, that is in front of the incisive foramen, it is either complete, that is absence of premaxilla, complete cleft of the primary palate, that is absence of premaxilla, if it is incomplete, then it is a rudimentary premaxilla is present. It can be on one side or both sides or on the center. So unilateral, bilateral, or median, incomplete primary palate cleft. Next, cleft of the secondary palate, that is behind the incisor foramen. So if it is complete, as I told you, nasal septum and humor are separated from the palatine process. There is complete uh, cleft. In an incomplete cleft, there is a continuation with the nasal septum and the boma. They are, they are not separated from the palatine process. It is incomplete, or it is one is just submucosal cleft palate, the secondary palate. Okay, so this can be with soft palate involvement or without the soft palate involvement. Next, cleft of both the primary and secondary palates. That is both the premaxilla is in front of the incisor foramen and behind the incisor foramen that is cleft to both primary and secondary palates. Next, cleft lip and cleft palate together that is class 5, both lip and palate together. Okay, so this is one important classification of cleft disorders, LAH is last classification wherein L stands for lip, A stands for alveolus, H stands for hard palate and S stands for the soft palate. When it is classified as capital LAHS, that is complete type of clefting of all these four structures. Small letters for incomplete type. If it is unilateral. Now if you have, if you have to denote it on bilateral, then you have to guide LAHS, HAN on both sides. It's again the same classification. The typical distribution of cleft types is cleft lip alone is 15. Combined cleft lip and palate is maximum, that is 45%. Isolated cleft palate is 40%. So cleft palate isolated is more than cleft lip. And cleft lip and palate combined is the maximum, has maximum incidence. The cleft lip or palate predominates in males, but a cleft palate alone, only the palate, it is common in females. In unilateral cleft lip, the deformity affects the left side usually in 60% of cases. So the left side is more commonly seen. So coming to the problems, what happens when a, when a baby has a cleft disorder? One has difficulty in sucking and swallowing. This is more so in case of a cleft palate than in cleft lip alone. So a cleft palate and cleft lip combined, yes, this difficulty is maximum. But then a cleft lip alone has more difficulty in sucking and swallowing than compared to a cleft lip alone. The palate has a more. Next, speech is defective, especially in cleft palate again. That is difficulty in formation of letters B, G, K, P, T, and G. This involves the involvement, this involves the uh, participation of the palate. These formations involve the participation of the palate. Also, there is anterior dentition and supernumerary teeth in case of cleft palate deformity, more commonly the premaxilla or the primary palate. Recurrent upper respiratory tract infections are common involving the secondary palate. Again, there is respiratory obstruction, soft palate involvement, chronic otitis media, middle ear problems, also cosmetic problems. There is hypoplasia of the maxilla especially when it is involving the lip and palate, primary palate. Problems due to other associated disorders. So these are the problems that we commonly face in a cleft disorder.
So how do you manage? That is one primary, that is primary management and secondary management. Primary management is after the surgery. Secondary management is surgery and beyond, beyond surgery. So first, antenatal diagnosis is important. We have to, all, uh, all the cleft disorders uh, can be scanned uh, ultrasonographically, usually from 18 week onwards, except for cleft palate. Isolated cleft palate is difficult to diagnose ultrasonographically comparatively. Now, next we have to refer a refer the uh, expectant mother to a cleft surgeon. Photographs of cleft lip shown to parents before and after surgery are very important. Introduction of a parent to a parent support group and meeting parents of other children born with a similar disorder who have undergone the surgery may also be helpful. Coming to problems of feeding, usually uh, cleft lip and palate disorder here students, they usually feed well and thrive, provided there is appropriate advice given and support. Bre breastfeeding is usually possible when the cleft is incomplete and confined to the lip. If it is confined to the just lip, lip uh, uh, cleft or uh, palatal cleft which is incomplete, then there is not at all a problem in breastfeeding. Otherwise, a complete palatal uh, cleft, then you have you can have good feeding patterns by using certain special devices that is Mead Johnson or a modified teeth device or orthodontic and new devices. Also, enlarging the hole in the teeth or the feeding plates that are these are special plates that are constructed from the dental impression of the upper jaw. So these are in conjunction, they, they merge with the normal anatomy, these kind of feeding plates help for feeding, improving the feeding. Next problems with airway, there are major airway uh, respiratory obstruction in Perry Robinson sequence that I told you. Hypo hypoxic episodes during sleep and feeding can be life threatening. They can be episodes of hypoxia and uh, and hypoxia during feeding and while sleeping. So, intermittent airway obstruction is more frequent and is managed by nursing the baby in a prone position. Severe and persistent airway compromise, then you have to use a retained nasal, you have to retain a nasopharyngeal intubation to maintain the airway when there is severe airway obstruction. So, what are the principles of cleft surgery? The ultimate goal is always to attain a normal appearance of the lip, of the face and the nose, nose and the face and also speech should be normal and also dentition and facial growth should be within the normal range, it should be range of normal development. So in a cleft disorder, the ultimate goals are first of all, for the normal appearance, cosmetic appearance of the face, the nose and the lip and also try to attain speech as near to the normal as possible. Dentition and facial growth should be as near to the normal as possible. So these are the goals of cleft repair. This timing of primary cleft and palatal procedures is very important. Quite commonly asked, it is after the layer. So a cleft lip alone, when there is only cleft lip on one side, usually five to six months. On both sides, four to five months. So a cleft lip within six months, you have to operate. A cleft palate alone, so when the soft palate is involved, okay, then six months. And both soft and hard palate involved, then you have to do a staged procedure. First clean the soft palate at six months, and next hard palate before 18 months. This is the age before which the hard palate has to be operated upon. When there is combined cleft lip and palate, on one side, again two staged operation, the cleft lip and soft palate at six months, hard palate and gum pad within 18 months. Okay, so six months and 18 months is important. Now cleft lip and palate combined on both sides, again stage procedure, initially the cleft lip and soft palate at four to six months, and the hard palate gum within 18 months. Okay, so this is the important timings of repair for cleft disorder. <coughs> Firstly, coming to cleft lip, various types are central cleft lip, which is usually rare, this is in the upper lip between the two median nasal processes. 
it forms a hair lip deformity. It's called the central cleft lip or hair lip deformity. The lateral one again in the upper lip because of uh, improper fusion between the maxillary and the median AC processes. It can be unilateral. Lateral ones can be unilateral or bilateral. This is more common. Lateral kind of uh, cleft lip is more common. It can be unilateral or bilateral. Again, incomplete cleft lip does not extend into the nose. When a complete cleft, cleft lip will extend into the floor of the nose. Simple cleft lip is only cleft in the lip. A compound lip is long with the alveolus also. So a cleft lip with a cleft alveolus is a compound cleft lip. This is type 1. Central cleft lip or hair lip, which is usually rare. The more common one is a lateral one. Type 2. Okay. Between the main perfect vision between the maxillary process and the median nasal process, it can be unilateral or it can be on both sides bilateral. This is a clinical picture of the same the unilateral cleft lip, lateral type, and the bilateral cleft lip on both sides. These both are lateral types of cleft lip, unilateral and bilateral. Next, a white cleft lip and palate, which is complete in a child. So this is a complex compound involving both the cleft lip and palate. The lip and the palate also involved. Again, the same thing, treatment. The timing of treatment, unilateral on one side, operate at five to six months of age. If it is on both sides, Within five months, one operation followed by the second side on, on the other side within three weeks. So there is a million criteria which is used to undertake surgery for a cleft lip. What are the criteria? What is the criteria? Rule of ten. The baby should be ten pounds in weight, ten weeks old, and ten grams to have ten grams hemoglobin. So remember, this is the rule of ten million criteria for operating upon a cleft lip. 10 pounds in weight, 10 weeks old baby, and 10 grams in all of them. So what are the principles of cleft lip surgery? Rule of 10 should be fulfilled compulsorily. It should be operated upon within 6 months, the cleft lip alone. The infection should not be there. What do we use? The million advancement flap is commonly used for unilateral cleft lip repair. The million advancement flap. Also, one stage bilateral cleft repair is done. Single stage, both sides cleft repair is done using U3 Mio method or maybe single stage or black method. Just have to remember these names, not more than that. So what is actually done, we will start and dealt with subsequently. Proper markings are made prior to the surgery and an incision should be given full thickness incision on the lip. That is involving the mucosa, the muscle and the skin. There is a full thickness repair. Usually, we have to give, we have to, give, uh, we need to have uh, intraoperative uh, hemostasis. So, we usually give adrenaline injection as low as 1 in 20,000. Dilution should be 1 in 2 lakhs. I mean, 1 in 2 lakhs dilution of adrenaline injection is used to achieve hemostasis during the lip reconstruction. The repair is done in three layers, I told you. The mucosal, muscular, and the skin. What are the uh, aims of this repair? The cupid's bow should be made, it should be left horizontally. After repair, this cupid's bow it should not be left elevated. This cupid's bow should not be left elevated. Then the continuity of the white line should be maintained. Also, the vermilion notching should not be there. The vermilion there should not be notching. There should not be this holding and notching on the vermilion. So these are the aims of proper cleft repair. So what is this milliard cleft flap? By rotating the local nasal labial flaps, this flap is this cleft is repaired. Rotating the local nasal labial flaps. So after the flap repair, we should also address the primary and secondary cleft palatal deformity if present. 
proper postoperative management should be there. There should be very good control of infection and also subsequent training for sucking, swallowing, and speech. The skin incisions, as told you, develop to restore the displaced tissues. So it improves the skin and the cartilage to the normal position. The muscular continuity is achieved by subperiosity undermining of the anterior maxilla. The maxilla subperiosity, you have to go to as deep as up to the maxilla, anterior maxilla, the subperiosteal layer. Next, laser lateral muscles are anchored to the pre maxilla with a non absorbing suture first. Then, the oblique muscles of the orbitalis solis are sutured to the base of the anterior nasal spine and the cartilaginous nasal septum. Once the closure of the lip is done, then the suturing of the horizontal fibers of the orbicularis oris is used to achieve the normal oral sphincter. So first, we have to go to the oblique muscles of the orbicularis oris, which are sutured to the base of the nasal spine, anterior nasal spine. The nasolabial muscles, they are anchored to the premaxilla, and then stepwise fashion, these three are, these two are closed, finally by the, closed by the horizontal fibers of the Orbicularis or its muscle are closed. Once the muscle layer is closed, then the mucosal layer, and on top of it, the skin is closed. Okay. Here, the skin incision. So you need it with left lip. This is after closure of the lip. And all the three layers right from the cartilage to the orbitalis or this muscle. In case of a bilateral complete cleft lip, these are the incision, skin incision given. And finally, the closure. You bring down this and then close. Okay. This is the clinical picture for unilateral cleft lip before surgery and after surgery. Proper reconstruction after surgery, the picture is so fine. This is a bilateral cleft after repair. Remember, a bilateral cleft has to be properly closed in order to maintain the normal oral aperture. The horizontal fibers that of the obliquitous organs that are closed have to be very properly sutured so as to maintain the normal oral aperture and also maintain the vermilion, the cupid's bow horizontally. Okay, so this is with the cleft lip surgery uh, for the class today. Next coming class, I shall talk to you about the cleft palate surgery. Okay, so any doubts you can always ask me now, or now if we have we have no time, cross the time limit. You can always ask me your doubts in your next class. Okay. Thank you. Please go to the topic again. And then come up with your doubts if you have any. Come prepared for the next class. Okay. Thank you.